Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Fulbright Forum. My name is Ben Harris, and I'm the Executive Assistant of the Korean American Educational Commission. Tonight's presentation will last about 50 minutes. We ask that you hold all questions until the Q&A at the end. Afterward, please stay and enjoy light refreshments prepared by the KAC staff. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce 2015-2016 junior researcher Simone Gosby, who graduated from Smith College with a bachelor's in international relations and East Asian studies. People with disabilities, long marginalized in Korea and frankly everywhere else in the world, are the focus of Simone's research in Korea. Simone notes in her project abstract that in a society where education and economic contribution is a measurement of one's societal participation, PWD are wrongly seen as pitiful beings who are unable to fully contribute to society. Despite a slate of victories regarding the legal rights of people with disabilities over the last 30 years, the disability rights movement in Korea is still fighting to make the wider general public realize that people with disabilities deserve to be seen and treated equally. Rather than examining the movement of, as a whole, Simone is approaching the issue with a magnifying glass. Through personal interviews uh, with students with disabilities, Simone hopes to better understand how personal self-determination has helped these students succeed and how this skill has affected their lives. This research is both timely and important, and we are excited to have Simone here to present tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming her to the front. Hello, everybody. As Ben said, my name is Simone. Half of you probably know me as Momo. Um, and like he said, I graduated from Smith College last year. Um, and yes, I'm doing um, research on disabilities. So um, I want to start off by giving you all a little background about why I'm uh, studying disabilities specifically in South Korea. Um, although I do identify as a student with disabilities, uh, before fall 2013, I wasn't really interested in disability, disability issues or rights or just anything that had to, that related um, to disabilities. Um, it wasn't until I studied abroad at Yonsei University um, that I became interested in this subject. Before coming to Korea, I heard um, a lot from people that uh, disability, is, disability is still a very taboo subject, and people with disabilities usually stay at home, away from the public eye. Um, so, that's, so when I came to Korea, that's what I expected. <coughs> but while studying abroad, I ended up joining the Disability Advocacy Group at Yonsei, um, which completely changed my thinking um, of disabilities in Korea. The Disability Advocacy Group at Yonsei not only consisted of students with disabilities, but also students without disabilities. Um, and seeing this exhibited that, on some level, Korea's, Korea society's uh, attitude towards disabilities, uh, more so the younger generation, is changing for the better, and people are becoming more and more comfortable talking about the issues that people with disabilities face. Um, it is true that in the past, people with disability, disabilities mainly stayed um, out of the public eye, and this is partly due to two reasons. One, social stigma, pretty strong social stigma, and two, in an, in an, in an, in an environment um, made for able people, it was hard for those who were physically disabled to, um, to get around. But during my time in Korea uh, in 2013 and now, I've observed that disabilities is becoming less stigmatized and the outside environment is more accessible. National and provincial uh, legislation has greatly improved the situation um, of people with disabilities over the past 30 years. And this change is thanks to the little known yet greatly influencing disability rights movement. Um, and as my uh, title uh, shows, my research is about this, how the skill of self-determination uh, has an effect on the lives of students with disabilities in Korea. Uh, but before I talk about that, I want to give you all, um, there's a kind of a little bit, a lot of background information that I would like to fill you all in. Um, and I will start by the, um, giving you a, a little history about the disability rights movement. Um, so something that you all will probably notice during my talk is that external international forces um, strongly influenced the early stages of disability rights development in Korea. Uh, and this is one of them. So the UN designated International Year of, disability, um, pe of Disabled People in 1981, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Disabled Persons, uh, the, U Un the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, and the Principles of Anti-Discrimination all provided background to the Korean disability rights movement. Uh, these documents completely changed the discourse of, um, 
uh, surrounding disabilities from individual fault to social responsibility uh, regarding the problems that people with disabilities face. Uh, largely influenced by the UN's 1981 um, declaration, the, ministry, the Korea's Ministry of Health and Social Affairs created Korea's first welfare law. However, this law was mostly for show and was backed by very little action. <laughs> it's okay, Joyce. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, how, uh, so, um, <laughs> thanks, Joyce. <laughs> Organized activity and protests from the, disa from the disabled community became big in 1987 uh, when it was revealed that Seoul would host the 1988 Paralympic Games. Um, opponents of Seoul's hosting of the Games believed that it cloaked the severe violations of the rights of disabled people. Um, but in the end, Seoul hosting the 88 Paralympics actually showed to be helpful for the movement. The, with the international community's uh, attention on Korea, the Rotehi government uh, had no choice but to quickly amend the existing welfare law to satisfy the demands of the protesters. Those demands included um, enhancing social status, the social status of people with disabilities, because at that time, a majority of people with disabilities were uh, living in poverty. Uh, also establishing legislation for equal, uh, equal um, employment and enacting an affirmative action for education because at that time uh, a lot of students were rejected by schools on the basis that they were disabled. So uh, a month before the game started, uh, through a presidential decree, the Committee for Health and Welfare for the Disabled was created. Um, it was created. Uh, and then at less than a year after that, the committee presented the Comprehensive Plan of Disabled People's uh, Welfare Policy Report, which laid out um, the, the measurements that should be taken over the next 10 years. Uh, and some of those measurements included welfare, the improvement of uh, welfare facilities, improvement of educational facilities, the installation of a national special education institute, and more. And in the end, the Paralympics also had an effect on Korean society as well, as the games brought um, disability issues to the forefront of the mainstream, uh, of people in the mainstream's minds, as it challenged the previous stereotypes that people with disabilities were useless, pitiful members of society. Uh, in 1994, under the government of Kim Yong sam External pressures, yet again, influenced the, the national process surrounding disability rights. In order to become a member of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, also known as the OECD, uh, multiple social welfare issues had to be resolved, which resulted in the planning of more, social, of more welfare laws. Among those laws was a special university admission for students with disabilities. This system created a separate admission process for students with disabilities um, and encouraged uh, students to attend university and subsequently increased the number of um, disabled students pursuing higher education. Uh, the first universities to adopt this admission were Yonsei University, Yuhua Women's University, Sogong University, Taegu University, and the Presbyterian College and Theological Cemetery. <clears throat> a seminary. <laughs> um, <laughs> currently, the number of universities that have implemented this uh, admissions process is around 100 uh, universities, which is about 5% of the universities nationwide. Um, so if you know about any, if you know a little bit about modern Korean history, you'll know, or even if you watched the recent drama Reply 1988, you'll know that protests were a very big part of the democracy movement in the 70s and the 80s. The disability rights movement was no different. The movement fought for and continues to fight for the right uh, to medical treatment, economic and social security, the right to education, and right to mobility and, and more. All of which are fundamental human rights outlined in the UN Declaration um, on Universal Human Rights. Um, uh, uh, something that Korea is a signature country to. So during the early 2000s, the movement probably fought hardest for mobility rights. Uh, demands included um, 
uh, wheelchair accessible buses, uh, sub, um, elevators in every subway stations, uh, and, and comfortable and safe usage of other amenities. Um, there are multiple sit-ins in front of Seoul City, the National Sim uh, Seoul City Hall, the National Assembly, and other government buildings, many of which became violent with police intervention. Uh, and I'll show you um, an example of one of those. Uh, this is a trigger warning for police brutality. <laughs> contraption um, in many of the subways. Uh, this is a stair lift that, that was um, installed uh, in all of the subways before elevators were available. Um, however, unfortunately, many people in wheelchairs uh, were injured or died on these due to the inadequate operation or faulty machines. Um, on August 12, 2002, a hunger strike and subway demonstration began in response to the death of a man while using the subway lift. And again, I'll show you another video. This is not as violent. <laughs> on public transportation for the WEEK Act, for the Week Act uh, was passed. Um, outcomes of this were buses having wheelchair lifts and some subway stations having elevators and uh, some, some of you may have seen the yellow bricks on, on the sidewalks for people uh, who, uh, for, for usually for blind people. Uh, so those all were in, uh, implemented. 
Um, and so these are even more uh, protests that happen. So this is these two are what we just saw of the the subway um, demonstration and uh, outside of the National Assembly. And people even today are fighting for equal rights, uh, equal pay um, when it comes to employment. Um, and this this uh, to the right is a picture of um, of a demonstration um, at. Uh, the Gangnam bus station because uh, a lot of internet, uh, all the intercity buses are are not accessible by wheelchair. Um, so uh, other <coughs> uh, protests and demonstrations resulted in the passing of a renewed and less abstract special education for people with disabilities act in 2006, the anti discrimination law in 2007, and the Children's with Disability Act in 2011. And these are uh, more. Uh, legislation that has been passed. So that's the history. Now I'll talk about the current situation. Um, so currently there is an estimated that there's over 2,600,000 people with disabilities uh, within Korea and they make up about 5.4 percent of the total population. Um, th these people are all categorized with um, under 15 types of disabilities. Uh, physical, brain lesions, blindness, deafness, speech impediment, uh, intellectual development uh, disabilities, autism, mental disability, uh, kidney disorders, heart disorders, respiratory disorder, liver disorder, facial disorder, intestinal disorder, and epilepsy. Mm -hmm. One thing to note uh, is that unlike the American Disability Act, uh, Disability Act learning disabilities is not included here. <clears throat> Uh, so national and provincial legislation surrounding disability needs and demands have increased and began to cover more and more aspects of uh, people with disabilities' lives. Uh, despite this, people with disabilities are still a marginalized group within Korean society. Um, and this can be seen, this, this is supported by, um, by statistical data. So if you look at education, um, so 11.6% so of the disability population has no degree at all, 28.8% only hold up until an elementary degree, 16.2% uh, hold up until a middle school degree, 28.1% hold until a high school degree, and only 15.3% hold a college degree or higher. Uh, when you compare that to the overall population, 14.4% uh, hold uh, until an elementary school uh, degree, 14.5% hold until a middle school degree, 51.7% hold until a uh, high school degree, and 19.4% of, um, of the overall population holds a college or a graduate school degree. Uh, and one reason for the lower percentage when it comes to education, uh, especially in high school and higher education, is because a majority of the schools uh, are, un are unable to provide uh, the necessary academic um, accommodations for students. Um, and in a society where schooling and grades are very important, uh, many disabled students end up dropping out of school. Uh, and then we can also look at the economic status of people with disabilities. Um, in, in this case, 31.8% are considered lower class, 11.9% are considered middle class, and only 0.9% are considered upper class. When you compare to overall population, 14.3% of the overall population is lower class, 67.1% are middle class, and 18.6% are uh, upper class. So when you see, when you see the, the data compared like this, it is very uh, clear that people with disabilities are, econo or are very much economically disadvantaged. In 1991, uh, a, a mandatory employment system was uh, set in place to promote employment of people with disabilities, as well as abolish employment discrimination. Uh, the system required that central uh, and local governments, public institutions, and private companies with more than 50 ordinarily employed workers um, to employ people with disabilities at a given proportion of those uh, ordinarily uh, employed workers. So that means that 3% of the, the working force in the government has to be people with disabilities. For public institutions, it's 2.5 to 3%. And for private companies, it's 2.5%. Uh, 
uh, if companies and institutes do not follow this mandatory requirement, they have to pay a fine of uh, 6,700 670,000 Korean won per month per person that falls short of this target. Yet despite this quota and despite it being mandatory, um, because of the, the, the idea that people with disabilities will probably cause more safety accidents or they do not work as well as abled uh, people, uh, companies are more willing to pay that fine than actually hire people with disabilities. So it's very hard for, for, for the disabled to find jobs within Korea. Um, as of 2004, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities was 6.6%, which is almost double um, the overall unemployment, which was 3.6%. Uh, and you can also see that by this graph that um, students, people with disabilities are paid only 72% of the overall month, uh, monthly wage that able people are. Um, and so representing 5.4% of the population, people with disabilities only um, account for 2.8% of the total employment uh, workforce. Another system the government implemented for the benefit of people with disabilities is the disability grading system. So the system decides how much government support an individual can receive. Um, and people are, are graded on a scale from one to six, one being the highest, and six being, uh, one being the, the most severe, and six being the least severe. Um, so this, this, the grade decides what economic support or services uh, a person is able to access, such as social security pensions, tax exemptions, uh, and mobility assistance. However, this system is seen as discriminatory because it assumes that people, that every person within a certain grade uh, requires the same things and it doesn't leave room for, for uh, disability and, and individual differences. Uh, for example, in 2014, uh, a man uh, in a wheelchair was uh, stuck in a fire and was unable to get out, um, but he was considered a level three, and as I wrote here, only level one and level two are eligible for mobility assistance. And people believe that if the government had um, had <coughs> granted him the mobility assistance that he uh, that he previously requested, that he would still be alive today. But unfortunately, that is not the case. Um, so people, so a lot of the, so the disability rights movement is. Um, is continuing to protest to abolish the system and rather than putting people within grades to, to um, individually assess people's needs. So while looking through many of these existing laws, I, okay, so yeah, that, that's all the background, so <laughs> we're almost there. Um, so while looking through many of the existing laws, I saw a certain word come up over and over again, uh, and that word is 사회 동화. Which means this word can be translated in two ways, which means it can either be social integration or social inclusion. Um, for the means of my uh, for my research, I uh, translate it as social inclusion because for me, social integration seems that people with disabilities have a, have to change and accommodate for the mainstream, while in reality, it's the mainstream that has to change itself and be able to um, accommodate for the differences within society. Um, so what is social inclusion and why is it important? As members of society, people with disabilities are entitled as human beings to the same rights and opportunities as people without disabilities. As is, is written here, social inclusion uh, is understood as a process by which efforts are made to ensure equal opportunities for all, regardless of their background, so that they can achieve their full potential in life. Uh, it, uh, social inclusion is aimed at creating conditions which enable full and active participation of every member of society in all aspects of life. Um, so, so if, if so many of these laws that are, have already been implemented state that the goal is, to, is social inclusion, why, I ask myself, why is social inclusion, why hasn't it been fully realized? Uh, why are people with disabilities still marginalized within Korean society? What's missing? Um, I believe that these laws could uh, be more effective and could lead to social inclusion if um, if implementations were if the if they were more strictly enforced, as we saw before. Even though the the, the mandatory employment 
um, percentage, it's mandatory, but not many people apply to that. Uh, or So if they were more strict about uh, implementation, maybe social inclusion could be fully realized. But that's not the case as of yet. Um, so then I asked myself, what barrier, what, so, what barrier or what social inclusion um, condition is holding, um, is holding this back, this social inclusion of uh, people with disabilities? Uh, in a 2014 um, survey, people, of, people with disabilities were asked, what is needed to get rid of discrimination? And the number one answer was improve societal awareness and understanding and interest. So what this means is that lack of understanding and awareness about disabilities is a barrier to the inclusion of people with disabilities. In order for social inclusion to be realized, the negative constraints, i.e. stereotypes, need to be eradicated. Thus, the question becomes, how do you change the thinking and promote understanding throughout all of Korean society? Seems like a pretty big job. Um, so after researching multiple methods of social inclusion, I came to focus on uh, a concept called 장애인 당사자 주의. I tried to find an English uh, translation of that, and I couldn't really find it. So, but basically, uh, what it means is that uh, this concept says that people with disabilities should be in charge of, of their own lives, of uh, the, the policies that uh, have to do with that make a difference in their lives uh, with, the, with the disability rights movement and so on and so forth. Um, and that's where my title comes from. Nothing, with, nothing about us without us. Nothing about people with, with disabilities should be decided without their participation and their, um, their views. Um, and this, this concept, it's, it's necessary because there's a widespread misunderstanding that within Korean society, that people with disabilities are pitiful people, or they are always in need of help. Um, and those, two, those uh, being pitiful and also being in need of help were the two most, um, uh, the highest answers in a certain survey um, back in 2009. So, so this, this, so this, um, this, this concept yet again changes the discourse surrounding disabilities. Rather than the common notion of able people helping disabled people, disabled people are at the forefront um, of changing able people's mindset in order for everybody to live in a, in a cohesive, inclusive society. So this, uh, if you look at this, this is uh, it's kind of small now that I realize, from probably all the way back there, but this is um, a tr triangle graph that I got from uh, a UN report called Creating, Creating an Inclusive Society. Um, and even in the UN report, it's, it says that uh, the levels of inclusion, the, the social inclusion process begins with the individual. Um, so and the individuals that need to be, to be at the forefront are people with disabilities. So in order for such a role for people with disabilities, for, for this role to be uh, effective, Consciousness and awareness about oneself is a core concept. One has to understand one's ability and needs in order to effectively, effectively convey um, the understanding toward to others. According to scholars, two overlapping skills are very necessary. Uh, one is self-determination and the other is self-advocacy. Self-determination enables individuals to make choices and engage in goal-directed, self-regulated, autonomous behavior. And, self, and people who are self-advocate, uh, who, who, who practice the skill of self-advocacy, are able to speak uh, for themselves and their own needs. And they also understand their, dis their disability and are aware of the strengths and weaknesses um, imposed by that disability. And they're also able to effectively communicate uh, their needs and accommodate accommodations. Um, both. Um, and both of these uh, skills um, are are believed to increase uh, to sorry to improve the quality of the life of um, people with disabilities, especially in the, um, their adulthood. And most importantly, 
Individuals that are equipped with these two intertwined skills often challenge the perception of others who view them as incapable of making decisions about their own lives. Um, it's important to note that self-determination is a Western concept. So that's when I got, again, I had to ask myself a question. Does this really apply to Korea if it, is, if it, was, if it was thought up by Western scholars? Um, so let me give you some. So in, for Western scholars believe that the, these skills should be taught as early as elementary school. Um, but when put in the context of Korea, this is kind of easier said than done. Um, and this is because of the, Korea, the way that the Korean education system is set up, uh, especially for younger Koreans in elementary school, uh, and especially in, in a society like Korea, students are used to following what their teachers say, um, and they don't have this, this opportunity to make choices and express their preferences or set their own goals. And when it comes to middle school, students are so focused on getting into good high schools, and when they get into high school, they're only, they're only focused on one thing, the, the college entrance exam. So there's no room, there's very little room because of this narrow focus on getting to a good middle school, getting to a good high school, getting to a good college, getting to a good, uh, getting a good job, that there leaves no room for effective um, uh, teaching of these skills within the classrooms. Um, however, this does not mean that students with, dis students with disabilities, specifically in Korea, are void of these skills. Um, it's believed that, uh, that humans have an innate pro uh, propensity to be self-determined. So then I had to ask myself again, so how do these students get this skill? How, how uh, are they taught this? How do, um, what, what uh, aspects of their lives allow them to, to be able to uh, make choices, express their preferences, and set their own goals? Um, so the component, and so that's what my, my research is, is specifically looking at. Uh, the components of so, uh, self-determination and self-advocacy are awareness, uh, self-awareness and self-knowledge, uh, choice and decision-making, goal-setting and attainment, uh, problem-solving, self-regulation and self-management, and self-advocacy. So self-advocacy is, is considered um, a sub-skill of self-determination. And within self-advocacy, um, uh, it is necessary for, for one to know their rights, to be able to communicate effectively, and to, and to um, be leaders. Uh, so these are what these uh, components are what I look for when I interview my my uh, interviewees. Um, so with my research advisor, I um, I created an uh, interview uh, or a structured uh, interview outline that asks um, my interviewees about their um, their their experiences in college, their experiences in middle school, high school, um, and elementary school, um, and also to compare those times. It also asks them about their understanding of their disabilities throughout, since middle school and until college, to see if there's a difference in what kind of um, experiences within their, within their lives have changed the, that thinking. Um, it also talks about whether, it also, I also ask them whether they have experienced any type of uh, type of discrimination or unfairness to see how they um, they deal with that and how and whether how they deal with it has changed from when they're younger until now and then I continue to ask various questions that try to see to see if they are self-determined or self-advocate uh, advocates um, so so far I have interviewed six students six um, students that and their ages are very, very from um, 23 to 28, um, and they also all vary in disability grade, um, and as you can see, most of them are physically disabled. Um, so I hope to continue, as I continue my um, interviews, I hope to make it more, to have a, a, a wider range of different disabilities, including um, uh, people who are hard of seeing, um, people who have, um, mental uh, 
uh, what's it called, mental uh, uh, disabilities, uh, and so, so on and so forth. Um, so, hopefully with this research, I really want to try to pinpoint uh, what the factors that influence people with disabilities to exercise self-determination and self-advocacy. And hopefully by, by pinpointing these factors, I can see how they can, um, how they can be reflected in other social settings, um, other than, than universities and schools. Um, and hopefully, by doing this, I hope to forward the discussion with, about learning disabilities, because the discussion about learning disabilities now is where the discussion about physical and mental disabilities was 20, 30 years ago. Um, so, and as a person with a learning disability, I know how, how difficult it is to try to stay up, stay with people who are not disabled, uh, but also, but also get good grades and all that kind of stuff and get into college school. <coughs> so, yes. So, so just as a little review, this is a little dark, but th this is like <laughs> my thinking of how I got to where I am now. So I started at very, very, at a very, um, ask, I started by asking myself what the social problem is, and it's that people with disabilities are still a marginalized group. Then I asked myself, how, how do we create a socially inclusive society? And then I came to the to decision that, um, that Misunderstandings and, and current stereotypes um, are are what are is hindering this uh, inclusive society. Then I ask myself, who should lead this change? People with disabilities should be at the forefront, and they should um, because this is about their lives, and they should be able to make these their own decisions. So, what is necessary for this? Self determination, self advocacy, and so then I get to, I ask myself finally, what factors influence self-determination and self-advocacy in a Korean context, since, it, since they're both Western concepts? And at the bottom I have a little question mark because that's where the analysis comes in. So, yeah, thanks for your attention. And any questions? Yeah. Yes? Are you accepting questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions, okay. comments, <laughs> unclear parts. I know it might have been a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we we ate tteokbokki uh, like a long time ago, so I don't know if you remember. Like, yeah. I, I said, yeah. I said I was a teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sam, I know. I know you're Deborah's friend. <laughs> okay. Uh, so because I'm a teacher here, actually my school's not too far from here. I'm curious about attention deficit disorders, mm -hmm. and how how can students be self-advocates for something that can be explained by like a lack of, of diligence because it seems to be the general attitude of parents yeah maybe not the students but the parents that if students work hard enough if they go to hard one long enough they can yeah. overcome their peers they can succeed yeah and i wonder if that translates into attention deficit disorders if, if it's even recognized if it's medicated it, and that's the thing it's not recognized and i i would put attention deficit disorder, ADHD, ADD, under learning disabilities. Um, and I know, I was talking to one friend before I came to Korea who was too taught uh, in Busan, and she was saying how um, she had one student who was obviously, from, from, a, from a Western perspective, we would call it ADHD, but the, others, the, the, the other teachers would just label him as the bad child. They wouldn't really want to, to, to pinpoint why he was acting the way he was. Um, and then there was no, also another child in her class that was um, very obviously had Down syndrome, but the parents didn't, wanna, didn't want to, um, to acknowledge that because, again, the stereotypes that are, are associated with disabilities. So in a lot of in the, well, the, the literature that I've read, the, the, the role of the parents and the role of the teachers are very important um, but uh, but again like you said um, it's kind of hard when when people don't want to acknowledge that kind of stuff so um, I feel like that's under learning disabilities and that's also a, a conversation that really needs to be forwarded within Korea because those 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 are different like learning disabilities the uh, ADHD those stuff they're not doesn't make you a bad person it's just that you learn differently um, and I think Korea still needs to um, 
or just anywhere, needs to account for those, those differences. <coughs> um, so, yeah. Thanks for the question. Yes, Dan. Um, so the going kind of kind of has to do with what he was talking about, and the idea of self determination and self advocacy. Mm -hmm. I wonder if certain groups of people within the disability um, category might not be able to self advocate. For example, severe schizophrenia, and I saw that mental illness was like part. Of, you know, included in that mm -hmm. group of what disability accounts for. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, what are your thoughts on like, not just self-advocacy, but um, familial advocacy, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense? So like one person taking responsibility for another, mm -hmm. which I feel like is more, um, I guess, analogous to how like family units work here. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Um, so that's actually a question. So through a lot of the, um, the interviews that I've done, uh, a lot of the interviewees have participated in disability, disability clubs or advocacy groups, um, and they said, a lot of them said that before coming to, to before participating in those groups, they kind of, they, they themselves, even though they were disabled, had negative, um, had negative thoughts about disabilities. They, were, they thought that, dis that people with disabilities were just the weaker pe people of society. But after they came and, and were part of this activity, this advocacy group, and, kind of, and heard about um, other people's experiences and had a, a, a space to talk about disabilities without, being, um, without having this, sti uh, this stigma, um, then they became more open. They became, they, what's it called, they gained understanding about not only their own disability, but, but the disability, but disabilities as a whole. So the, so the familial, what'd you say, familial? Like the advocacy yeah, portion, yeah. yeah. For like someone with like severe schizophrenia who is so out of touch re with yeah. reality, if, if they're in like a, you know, yeah. in a psychotic yeah. state, yeah. how would they, you know, advocate for themselves? So kind of And that's, that's where education that familiar, that, yeah. that kind of group uh, is very important, um, and that's one factor that hopefully, that I'm trying to see how that can fit into other social settings. But um, being able to just have, like, we have safe spaces in America. We talk about all those all the time. About those all the time. To be able to have that kind of safe space is something that's really necessary in Korea. Um, and and a lot of the students who I interviewed, they said that they were the only person with disabilities in their school. Um, and as the as I show through the statistics, the the number of students disability students going to middle school and high school are very low. So that's also it's again people, there's, it starts with getting rid of the certain stereotypes so that so that people um, with disabilities can be freely go to school and that schools can also be able to, to, to support the students and it all builds up. But yeah. <laughs> Oh gosh, okay, yes. <laughs> I was fascinated by how learning disabilities are not included in the legislation that identifies other kinds of disabilities, yeah. right? And is that unique to Korea or is Korea typical of other countries in that situation? What do people say about the lack of the inclusion of learning disabilities and the possible array of disabilities that are recognized legally? That's actually a good question. I should actually look into that because I, uh, since I've only been specifically looking at like comparing um, <clears throat> Korea with the U.S. and the, the ADA and, and Korea's legislation. I haven't really looked at other um, countries and how they look at learning disabilities. So that's actually you know, something that I should um, that I will look into, um, and hopefully can get a better answer to you <laughs> next time. <laughs> uh, all the way in the back. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, in my neighborhood, we have a specialized school for the blind and for the deaf, mm -hmm. and so I was wondering. Um, if, first of all, if any of your ethnographic informants attended specialized schools, and just overall, what role do these specialized schools play in advocacy and in creating advocates themselves? So none of my interviewees uh, went to the specialized school none so far. Um, but when it comes to, to special to specialized schools, those are places where um, self like skills like self determination, self advocacy are more um, more they're stressed more in those schools, um, and the 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 curriculum uh, allows for such teaching, um, which 
there is one person who I, I am planning to um, interview who did go to a special um, special education school. And I do want to see what if that makes a difference when it comes to people who didn't attend those kind of schools and uh, with people who did attend those kind of schools. So thanks for your question. Yes, Ben. I know that you're still in the process of interviewing people and you, and you haven't finished conducting your analysis yet, but, but have you noticed any any common themes are you starting to emerge with the people you have interviewed? Def so like yes, definitely. Uh, like uh, like I said, when I, uh, talk, uh, answering Dan's question. One thing is that when they were in middle school or younger, they 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 didn't really see disabilities in the positive light. But after they came and were able to have this kind of community um, and 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 um, and they were they were um, their Thinkings about disabilities changed, um, and also I asked when I asked uh, students what's the difference between their time in middle school, high school, and elementary school compared to their time in, in college, and a lot of them say freedom or they have more more choice. Uh, they have more things that they can choose by themselves. Um, actually, almost all of them have said that. So um, that's also a factor that that uh, be. Um, being encouraging students with disabilities and people with disabilities to make their own decisions is something that's very important. What exactly do you mean by, by freedom and, and having more things to choose? Because it's, it's really interesting that you say that because the students that I taught that went on to college mm -hmm. and high school, I mean, they said the same thing, like that they have just more freedom and then they can choose, mm -hmm. uh, have, have more freedom of choice. So in what way is that different from, from students without disabilities? It's, it's the same, because, okay. and, like, Self-determination and self-advocacy, we, we all have probably have those skills in one way or another, um, but the difference between p students without disabilities and students with disabilities is that uh, students with disabilities are seen as, okay, like by the parents and by, uh, by teachers that, oh, I have to make this, like they are like, I have to make this decision for them. So they don't have that kind of freedom to make those decisions, um, while people without disabilities get that freedom. So. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Esther. <laughs> um, I just was really struck by the historical bit that you're talking about in 88 when South Korea was um, hosting the Paralympics and there was a lot of <laughs> protest against that. Um, I just remember because um, when I was in New York, I, I just remember this your presentation, but Korea is now the chair of the committee for um, CRS rights, uh, pers I, the Committee on Rights for Persons with Disabilities, uh -huh, uh -huh. and I was wondering how the disability um, groups feel about Korea chairing this kind of committee when there are so many issues now, or as you're, you're highlighting in your presentation, that there's, Korea's definitely not a, um, a good example of a country that has really Disability rights. So I wonder if you have if you have any sense of how people feel about creating chairs. Sorry, this kind of committee. I actually didn't know about that, so I'll look. <laughs> 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 Wait, is it is it a, a UN committee yeah, or? Yeah, it's a UN okay. committee, and um, and in Korea is the chair for 2005, mm -hmm. 2015 to 2016. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so I was wondering, like, if parallel, you know. Do people see this as an opportunity for Korea to kind of step up and, you know, I guess be um, forced to change mm -hmm. because they are now on this international platform mm -hmm. and in the spotlight? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. That's something I'll look into. But I feel like that being the chair of that committee, and also in 2018, again, Korea will be having the Special Olympics and the regular Olympics uh, in Pyeongchang. Pyeongchang. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I feel like those two events are very will will really show how Korea has changed for the better question mark uh, over thirty plus years. So um, that's something that I definitely want to look out for. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was I don't know if you've had a chance to talk with people who are older mm -hmm. with disabilities, but do you think there's like a big 
generational divide and why people are sort of like what people in 1988 were fighting for and what the nowadays are sort of looking for and also like just within um, like the disabilities group like mm -hmm. if it's like a very unified movement mm -hmm. that's very fractured or like how do different experiences sort of blend together or what sort of things would make it hard to like transcend differences within Definitely during uh, when I when I, I told you that all that I um, was part of a disability disability advocacy group at um, Yonsei, and every year they have a homecoming, so they invite um, previous uh, members from like since 1990s, 1980s, since then, and, and we and we get to like talk to them. So I went this year because I was in Korea, thankfully. Um, so uh, <coughs> definitely. Back in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, like I told you, it was mainly is mainly focused on mobility rights, and that has some largely that that has largely to do with people in wheelchairs. So back then, it was more it, the focus was more on, on people with wheelchairs, um, but now the, the the focus of the rights movement has well, was kind of forced to broaden, and because. Because physical disabilities is not is not as I showed you um, the whole list. It's, it's not just about physical disabilities. It's also about people who are hard of hearing, hard of seeing, um, and have in, like internal um, in, um, um, disabilities. So um, as for the disability rights movement, I I I from what I have read, it is pretty unified. It's not. It's not big like the civil rights movement back uh, in in um, the 60s in, in the U.S., but but it's it's it, they do continue to do protests. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen protests down uh, near Seoul City, uh, Seoul 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 um, Shitong, what's that in English? City Hall. City Hall. <laughs> 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 oh my God. <laughs> um, um, and and you can also there's a lot there. I've seen a, a lot of. Um, pro, um, demonstrations within subway stations. Um, they're not to that extent of the videos that I showed you, because um, I feel like police cannot get away with, well actually no, I, I, should, I just lied because they just got away with that a couple months ago with that kind of police brutality. So, um, but yeah, so uh, I think I answered your yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler. Uh, two things. <clears throat> I like that I used to teach English to uh -huh. Kim Sang Hong, the neighbor guy's wife, uh -huh. who's on the committee for, um, for like disability Welfare. policy in relation to IOC. Mm -hmm. So that would be like, interesting for me to get. She's a Korean, right? So it should be interesting for the Korean to talk to. Um, second thing is, your, in your presentation, I felt like the sort of part of where your research is, seems to be going is is the SASD part, right? Am I, or SD, the self-term determination oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> section, right? Yeah. And like talking about that with your interview yes. ease. Um, but like, yeah, and you mentioned like that it's, it's a, it's a uh, interesting s space or thing to ask about because it comes from this sort of Western tradition or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But so what I want to ask is, is, have you thought about maybe um, to ask, do you, do you run into any issue of self-identification? Because I feel that um, in order to be self-determined to for yourself, mm -hmm. right, and that's, that's doing things on your own, as you said, right? Mm -hmm. Self-advocacy is, is, is talking to others about your situation. But even before those, is this, this, this part of self-identification. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have a student who has a learning disability and, and their parents <coughs> are pretending that they don't or not telling people that they do because they want to make sure that their student, their child doesn't get caught out of a classroom or, or, or boycotted out of that classroom or school by other parents, then obviously their child won't really identify mm -hmm. in that way. And then their, uh, my guess would be that would have an influence on someone's self-determination or self-advocacy. So what I would want to, what, what I'm trying to get at is like, do you see any um, different levels than you expected in self-identification? Have you have you asked questions about that? Because um, just per personally, I feel from the people that I've met here who have learning disabilities or hearing disabilities, 
um, they might not have always identified with that group, for example, hearing disabilities and not with the sign language or anything like that. That's a good question. Um, yeah, when when I ask the questions, uh, although I don't ask it like, um, straightforwardly, it, that, that this issue of self-identification does come up. Um, and one that I remember, it's actually kind of the opposite. It's when when this person was younger, they always thought of themselves as, oh, I'm I'm OMG with the disability, with the with the disability, with the uh, 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 proof of What is that? This 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 discomfort uncomfortability uh, uncomfort yeah. is like yeah. you guys <laughs> I gotta get out of here. <laughs> um, uh, but then as as like th through his um, his time in college and, and and as like the chair the president of the advocacy group he he became to um, to see himself less as. Umji with the with the with the um, uncomfortable leg, but Umji the peop the person who gets along with people. Umji Umji who who um, who who like likes to make jokes on that kind of stuff. So kind of um, what a lot of people have said is that they kind of, they see although they saw themselves as being disabled, now it's like disability is something that society has put on them rather than. Um, something that they, let's see, how can I more explain this a little bit better? Rather than being disabled, they, they are just differently abled in their minds. Um, so it kind of goes, kind of the opposite of, of the example that you gave. Um, but I think when this, this issue of self-identification um, has more to do with maybe the, the, the visibility of one's um, of one's disability, um, the easier that you can hide your disability, the easier it is to not be not have to identify with being um, disabled. Um, so, but I haven't run into anybody who like as I as you saw the people who I have. Uh, I've, interviews thus far are mostly physically disabled, so I haven't run into anything of anybody but having issues with self. What I, what I think I'm trying to get at more is like, I think, are, do they, are there a point in these people's like lives when they say, oh, this isn't just, I'm the only one who had this issue, there are other people like me, and I belong to this group. Like, yeah. Do they talk about that in your... Yes. Interviews is that like a yeah. part that you dig up as well? It's not something that I dig up on purpose, but it's something that does happen. Um, well, I guess they kind of do. When I talk about, when I ask them about their um, activities uh, on campus and all that kind of stuff, and a lot of them say that they do, um, um, they do advocacy group um, work on campus or stuff like that. Um, but I think it's when they come to, to college and they see, oh, there's other people that are like me. There's other people that are in wheelchairs. There's other people who have uh, hearing um, ha hearing impairments. Uh, I'm not just the only one. I think it's when when they go from an environment where they're the only person with disabilities in high school or middle school to an environment where it's more um, more um, there, there's more people like them within a, a college. And I think all of the people who I've uh, interviewed so far are all in colleges in Seoul. I hope I, if I could like continue this, uh, I would want to interview people who are outside of Seoul because, of course, Seoul is where everybody comes for college. So what is it like if I go down to Busan or Daegu or Kaesan, the middle of nowhere? <laughs> will will that still be will that be the same if they go from high school in in the, in the countryside to a college in the countryside? Will that will that still be the same? Um, who knows? That's a good question. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Um, thanks for a great presentation. Um, my question is about the mandatory employment system mm -hmm. uh, or that you mentioned. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that has surprised me about Korean like employment culture is one, that you need to have your photograph on your resume. Oh, yeah. And two, that even if you get through the interviews, there's a pretty, what I think by 
American standard is very invasive physical screening oh, and health yeah, yeah. screening they have to go through ahead of time. So um, I'm wondering, uh, on one hand, if there's any figures that you've uncovered uh, on how close to those quotas companies actually are in, in terms of the percent that they have. And if there's any sense on the part of the people you've interviewed that they're going to be screened out by their photo, by their physical disability, or conversely, maybe if you talk to people who are actually working, if there's a sense from maybe them or their coworkers that that they were less deserving than uh, than they may otherwise have been because there's okay. a sense that they were only given that position because of those quotas. Uh, when it comes to the quotas, there hasn't been anything. Nobody said anything about that. But when it comes to the special admissions policy in, in colleges, uh, people have talked about that um, and how at first when they got to, to schools like Yonsei know, University, they didn't really feel that they should be proud that they got into this, this, this great school because, because of this uh, admission policy. Um, but, but it's not like this, this, this admission policy and the, um, the employment um, mandatory employment um, system kind of they don't really it's not as if the they like here's a level for people for people who, for able people and here's the level for um, people with disabilities it's less like that so it's uh, I think Sorry, say your question one more time. Okay. <laughs> I'm um, getting lost in my own thoughts. <laughs> yeah, just if people have brought up, if the people you've interviewed, if they brought up like a concern that those practices in hiring mm -hmm. are going to screen them out, mm -hmm. that they are, they feel like even with that quota system or the mandatory employment system, they're going to be just, they feel they're going to be discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And and maybe in the second part of it, how effective is that mandatory employment system? Because it was, I was fascinated by the that there's a 640,000 one like opt out. Like, yeah. yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna yeah. follow that law, we'll yeah. just pay the fine yeah. for being to have to be discriminatory in our hiring practices. Um actually so when I talk to people about like especially people who are about who who just graduated and are going into um, the workforce, none of them actually talked about the, the mandatory um, system the mandatory employment system. Um, which makes me think whether they are aware of it. Um, but more than, yeah, so I, nobody really talked about it, so uh, I'm not quite sure about that. But when it comes to the actual effectiveness of the, 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 the system, um, numbers I saw were in 2014 for the government, it's supposed to be 3% of the, the working force is supposed to be people with disabilities. Uh, in 2014, it was like 1.7. Um, so it's like if the government can't hold up their own promise, then how do they how do they expect other people to follow that? So um, so yes. Where where does this money go? The fine, like if you have to pay a fine. That's a good question. Where does this money? Is it like a, does the government pay itself if if it's not filling its own quota? Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Is there, like, any, is there like a fund like that helps people with disability? I don't know. I, I, I need to look into that. Yeah. Like, That's a good question. Yes, Annie. I don't know what's the APOC in the US and Korea specifically, but throughout your, your literature that you've been going through, is there like a country that has a really sound system that others are looking to that they go, oh, we have this great thing, we should adopt this, whether it be in the West or in the East or anywhere else? Um, is there, are there any like countries that like their systems are being shown as like a good model? Like we look a lot in like Europe for education and things like that. Is there anything? So far from what I've read, there's every, because I'm looking at both uh, English and Korean literature, all the Korean literature looks to the U.S. and it's, <laughs> it's like, we're not perfect either, so uh, don't look at us, but, um, but so everything that I've read in the Korean literature looks to the U.S. as an example, um, because I mean, there, there have been um, uh, great strides in the U.S. when it comes to the ADA, the American Disability Act. Um, um, so I think that's the standard that Korea is looking at and 
It's a good question. I should Yeah. Um, you mentioned that mental disabilities go in as infancy here in Korea. And you know, say, say that again, is what? Mental disability in any form of mental illness um, from being associated with a disability. Mm -hmm. It's still in its infancy in terms of interventions or program mm -hmm. to help those people. Mm -hmm. um, or do you know if there's anything specifically that's being done? Because it's harder to identify someone with a mental disability versus a physical disability, and then self-identification yeah. becomes an issue here, yeah. particularly in Korea, where you know those type of things are very stigmatized and taboo. You know, what are some things that are being done, even though it's still in its infancy? Um, I mean, there are a lot. There are a lot of um, <coughs> what they call rehabilitation centers um, that that give. Um, people with physical and well, mostly mental disabilities. Um, I'm still like kind of iffy about how they work because there's some things in Korea that are like they're there, but you don't really know how they work. Um, but there are programs within local communities that help out. But when it comes to like the national, um, a national program, there's, from what I've read, there's nothing cohesive. Nothing cohesive. Something that can that I answer that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I know people are hungry. Any more questions? <laughs> no? Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you so much.